Isaiah 45 this morning. Isaiah 45 uh, in your Bibles, please. And uh, we do have a card here from uh, the Coffees. Uh, it says to our Maranatha family, we cannot thank you enough for your kindness and generosity to us last Sunday this past week. We certainly appreciate all the cards and gifts and thank you so much for the trip to Gatlinburg. We count it a great privilege to serve you and are grateful to God for giving us this opportunity. Thanks again. May, the God, may God bless you all, brother and sister Coffee. And so that was a blessing last week uh, to rejoice in the years that God has given them here at Maranatha Baptist Church. We thank the Lord for that. Isaiah 50, uh, excuse me, Isaiah 45, Isaiah 45, and we'll begin reading here in verse 20, uh, excuse me, verse 18. And uh, I want to revisit this passage of Scripture, really. I came, uh, brought a message out of this passage not too awful long ago, but we went in a little different direction with it then. Hope to be able to share some things with you this morning and be a blessing to you. Isaiah 45, and the Bible says here in verse number 18, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens... God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. Now that flies right in the face of those who'd like for us to stop inhabiting it. Amen. He created it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Amen. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together. Ye that are escaped of the nations, they have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. And so he says, verse 22, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, Every tongue shall swear, surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. Now that's coming one day. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful for your goodness to us now. And as we open the Word of God, our hearts desires for the Spirit of God to have liberty in every uh, mind, heart, Lord, that the Word of God might go forth into the seed of the Word of God, may go forth into fruitful, uh, fruit, fruitful ground, and Father, that it would not return void. We pray, Lord, you'd help us to have listening ears, that we may hear the truth you have for us today, and then, Lord, that we would respond accordingly to that. We are thankful to be able to be here in worship. We're thankful, Lord, that we have the opportunity in this life not only to know you, but to worship you in spirit and truth. God, I pray, help us now today. Help me to be a faithful messenger of thy word. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. This uh, focusing here on this uh, uh, Isaiah 45 and 22 in a minute. But in these verses, we find... God Almighty setting himself up against the idols of the heathen nations around the nation of Israel. You saw several times as we read, as if, it's a, uh, as if it uh, needed to be said in the sense that it's a shame it had to be said that there is only one God, that there is none else, that all the idols are not gods, but there is only one true and living God. And that's what he declared there, and rightfully so, because not only the heathen nations around Israel, but Israel had from time to time followed gods that, that were non-existent. Oh, they existed in, existed in stone and wood, uh, metal, some object, but behind them was nothing but the devil. And so God says there's only one God, and uh, he declared himself to be the only true and living God. And right here in these verses, especially Isaiah 45 and 22, he makes his divine, the buck stops here statement. And uh, he declares uh, himself uh, to be the only source of uh, help and blessing 
uh, for the people of His creation. God called and is calling the entire world to look to Him and stop looking to every other being or entity. Would to God this morning that all the living would call upon God in this day. Would to God they would look to Him and nothing else. Look to Him for everything. But especially that main thing, which is salvation. We live in a day and age of much confusion on every hand. I mean, uh, we were watching the news uh, last night. Sometimes that's a futile effort. And uh, Hudson was sitting there with me and uh, they started, they, they've got to where they have these panels now, you know. Everybody comes in there with their opinion. And they got in a big scrap and everybody talking over top of one another and Hudson, I mean, out of the mouth of babes. Hudson said, I didn't understand a thing they said. I said, amen, son, amen. <laughs> There's a great deal of confusion politically. Uh, and there has been and will continue to be until Jesus comes confusion religiously in our day. Why, brother, everybody's, everybody and their brother has got a philosophy not only politically but religiously. And so we live in a day and age of much confusion and especially regarding the means and the meaning of salvation. Uh, and we're, matter of fact, we're, uh, 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 we're seeing the trend here where... Uh, you know, it used to be you could kind of draw the lines and there were some that, that taught and preached a work salvation uh, opposed to salvation by grace. But now there's the blurring of those lines across the religious spectrum and everybody's using the same language, but they don't mean the same thing. And so we have, a, we have uh, in this, what I refer to as this age of religious nothing. The idea that we're all all right and God loves us and God's going to take care of us and it's all going to be okay. But that's not the Bible. Many folks attend church for years and never understand how to be saved. Right in one verse, understood and applied, God sets the record straight in verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God. And there is none else. Notice a few things this morning. First of all, God himself is the only reliable source of salvation, blessing, and help. God himself. We look to a lot of things uh, in this day and age, but God wants us to look to him. He says, look unto me. And that word me refers to God. And with regard to salvation, specifically the Lord Jesus Christ. Belief in God is not enough. I mean, you can go talking to people about the Lord and witnessing about the Lord and they'll say, oh, I, you know, I believe in God and all kinds of this other stuff. It's a bunch of generalizations that are, that are and, uh, philosophical generalizations that are sending men, women, boys and girls to hell. It's just that serious. Just because somebody goes around with t-shirts on that say something about God on them don't mean they're saved. It don't mean they even understand the Bible. It's a frightening thing. And I think sometimes we're too easy to pass off, you know, uh, the idea that if they use the right jargon, they must be all right. But the Bible says in James 2 and 19, Thou believest uh, in God, thou doest well. The devils believe and tremble. Uh, and so it's no big thing to believe on God. The devils do that. James 14, or excuse me, John 14, the Lord said, let, your heart be, uh, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And Jesus is the real turning point in it. What people do with Jesus Christ and any plan of salvation that does not include or tries in any way to circumvent Jesus Christ alone is absolutely futile in an effort for somebody to get saved. Man, if you push Jesus out, you push salvation out. If you belittle Jesus, you, there's no way for you to be saved. I mean, he is the Savior of all or he's not the Savior at all. But our world is full of false gospels that completely ignore Jesus Christ sometimes. Uh, despite Hebrews 12, 2 that says he is the author and finisher of our faith. 
And so let's be clear, Jesus Christ is not only Savior, but Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. The Bible says in John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word, John 1, 14, was made flesh. That is the incarnation. That's a big word that basically means that Jesus was God in the flesh. Amen. Amen. And we still believe that. I don't care what all the uh, modern religious uh, 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 institutions of uh, education are saying. We still believe Jesus is God. We still believe He's the only Savior. And it's just that simple. I mean, we've so overly complicated the thing. Uh, it's an absolute disaster. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3 and 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. A God was justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in the glory. Somebody said that's a single verse testimony of the life of Jesus Christ. John 8 and 58, the Lord said himself before Abraham was, I am. And so God and specifically the Lord Jesus Christ are the only source for salvation. And the Bible says in John 1 and 12, uh, the gospel of John verse 1 and 12, as many as received him, to them gave he power. Do you realize it uh, uh, to become the sons of God? You have no more power than the man in the moon to make yourself a son of God. That power comes from God. That enablement comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. I remember years ago uh, when I was in Bible college uh, and uh, trying to witness this guy I worked with. And I'd been with, trying to get him saved, trying to get him. I said, hey, uh, how'd you like to get together sometime and uh, and talk, I'll talk to you out the Bible about how to get saved. He said, well, I already got a plan. I said, do you? He said, I got a plan. It's coming up Easter. And he said, on Easter Sunday, uh, I'm going to go down here to this little Methodist church down the road from my house and get myself saved. I said, no, you ain't. Only through Jesus do you have the power to become the son of God. I don't know if he ever did or not. He would never give me time to talk to him. I don't know if he did. I don't know if he didn't. But I know one thing. If he didn't come to Jesus, he didn't get saved. <laughs> it's him that gives us power to become the sons of God. He says we're not born of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor the will of man. You and I, you and I cannot will ourselves into the kingdom of God. Uh, uh, you know, uh, no other will of man. Nobody can declare you a Christian. Which there are some that teach that, you know. Some institution declares you to be a Christian. Well, brother, if that institution didn't originate in heaven with Jesus Christ, that's of no authority at all, according to the Bible. And so, he, look here. He's not a partial Savior. He's the only Savior. And he is not. Look, he, and he, hey, he's got the choice as to what he does and how he does it. And I'll guarantee you this. He is not going to share the privilege of saving a soul with anyone or anything. That's what he does. And so he's not going to share it with the church or share it with an individual. The Baptist church is not a source of salvation. I hope the Baptist church is a place where Jesus is preached, where people can be saved. Amen. And uh, the church membership's not a source. Uh, I'm telling you, uh, if people say, you know, you go knock on the door and say, look here, uh, well, we'd like to go to church. Oh, we'd like you to come to our church. Oh, I already go to church. You do go to church. Oh, where do you go to church? Oh, uh, well, and then, uh, honey, what's that church we go to? Man, them people ain't no more saving the man the moon. What's your preacher's name? I don't remember. Well, you ain't been there very often then. Either that or they ain't printed his name in the bulletin since he got there. Amen. Strange stuff goes on in our day. And so it doesn't say anyway, look to the church or your good life or your baptism or your reformation or church ordinances or sacraments. He said, look unto me. And I'm convinced not only uh, are unbelievers looking in the wrong place anymore, but believers are looking to the wrong things for blessing and power and happiness in their life. God said, look unto me. Unto me. Until we do that, we're making a mess out of it. This man, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, divided history into B.C. and A.D. 
Somebody said, well, now it's, uh, what is it, BCE and some other things, CE. But you know, they still use the same numbers. It still divides on the same line. And that is the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All that mess and change of terminology is just an attempt to push Jesus out of the picture. But this Jesus is either a liar or he is who he claimed to be, brother. That is the Son of God. And every individual has to make up their own mind about Jesus. The most piercing question in the Bible, Matthew 27, 22, What shall I do then with Jesus which is called Christ? What are you going to do with him? What are you going to do with him for your own salvation? And then, dear believer, what are you going to do with him after that you're saved? If Christ did tell the truth, we've got to face up to what he said. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In Acts chapter number 4 and verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given, uh, unto heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3 and 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John, 1 John 5 and 12 says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. It doesn't say he that hath a church. He that hath a denomination. Matter of fact, denominations are trouble a lot of the time. I was talking to somebody the other day about something. I don't remember exactly what it was, but they said, now are you part of a denomination. I said, no. And uh, they gave the indication I'd been better off if I was for some reason or another. I can't remember what it was, but I thought to myself, no, sir. No, sir. I don't want some bunch of hierarchy sitting up somewhere in some other town telling me what I believe. Right. Telling the world what I believe sometimes. You say, well, this is a Baptist church. That's right, but it's an independent Baptist church. We don't belong to a denomination that can, tries to control our direction and tries to control our doctrine and uh, tries to control our philosophy. No, no, we let that be set in heaven and come right out of the Word of God. Amen. Amen. That's the way to have church. That's the way they had it in the Bible. Now, no denominations in the Bible. All those churches were independent. And you say, how do you know? Because you watched the trouble Paul had, tried to get him to go the same direction. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, look here. Uh, you, you know, uh, most of us will never be a millionaire. And uh, that's all right. But one thing I do know, you're not a millionaire until you got the millionth dollar. And so you're not a Christian until you have Christ. No matter how close you might be, the right terminology in a church somewhere, read your Bible, pray, whatever, give to it. It doesn't matter. Until you have Jesus, you are not a Christian. And you're on your way to, to a, a devil's hell, religious though you may be. And so uh, if I, we have to ask ourselves, then what is my hope of heaven? Uh, when I stand before God one day and the Bible says you will. God said in our text that you will one day stand before him. Hebrews chapter number 9 and verse 27, And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after that the judgment, judgment's coming. I didn't say it, God said it. Judgment's coming for every, every individual. Every person will face God in judgment in some way. It's coming. You say, well, how's he going to figure all that out? I don't know. Well, he, that's why he's God and we're not. Amen. But I can guarantee you one thing, whatever that judgment is, it'll be right. It'll be just. It'll be right down the line for everyone. It's coming. And so when I stand before God one day with regard to my salvation, I'd better not be telling him I, I deserve to get in here because I was a member of a church, uh, like Pastor said last Sunday, because I preached uh, or, uh, or I gave money or I helped the poor or whatever. Those are not means to salvation. The only hope I have is Jesus Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. 
On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. That's true of salvation. It's true of life. There are a lot of believers that, 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 that are on the solid rock of Christ for their salvation, but they're living and building their life on shifting sand. The philosophies of the world, uh, the promises of the world, uh, and all, uh, all that it says you'll have. But Jesus said, unless you uh, obey my sayings, you're building your life on shifting sand. Matthew 7. And so my only hope of heaven is Jesus died for me. And my only hope of blessing in this life is Jesus Christ uh, and my, my faithfulness to Him. So Jesus is the source of salvation, uh, blessing, and help. God said, look unto me. And be, He's the only source. To you looking to Him and Him alone. You're not looking in the right place. Whether it's for your salvation or your sustenance, Jesus got to be number one. God's got to be number one. Look unto me. And so he talks not only then about the source of salvation, blessing, and help, but he talks about the scope of it in verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved. I like this. All the ends of the earth. You know what that means? Everybody. Amen. Everybody. God wants to save everybody. God wants to bless everybody. Now he can't always do it. Why? Because they won't come to him. That's what Jesus was saying when he was looking at Jerusalem and talking about the Jews. And he said, how oft would I gather you under my, uh, under my wings as a hen doth her chicks and ye would not. It's a, it's a, man, it is a blessing to me beyond measure to think about the fact that God said, come unto me all the ends of the earth. Even at that time. When God had called out His people and the people of Abraham, God didn't even say in this verse, come unto me, Hebrews, Jews. He said, come unto me, all the ends of the earth. I'm glad God's a God that's not a respecter of persons. Amen. Amen. And He uh, is uh, ready and willing to save anyone that will come to Him by faith and to help anybody that will look to Him and trust Him for their daily life. God wants to bless your life. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you're from. Now you'll have to make His conditions. Amen. But brother, if you do, God will bless you good, boy. God uh, will fill your cup to overflowing if you'll let Him Look unto me, he said, all the ends of the earth. You know, not everybody needs some things. I mean, they think they do. And certainly not everybody needs everything. But there is nobody alive that doesn't need the forgiveness of sin and salvation. The Bible says why? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. I mean, God condemns us all. He said in Romans chapter number 3, uh, you know, uh, that all the world has been found guilty before God. We're born in sin. In sin did my mother conceive me, the Scripture said. All of us are that way. Sin passed down through the bloodline of man. And now we're all born sinners. And so a just and holy God, then because all are sinners, He made a way for all to be saved. And so He said, For whosoever shall, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. I'm glad it's open to everybody. Everybody. There's not a person on the face of the planet that ain't a candidate to get saved and a candidate to get blessed. Amen. Amen. That's our God. Hallelujah. I'm glad God just doesn't listen to preachers' prayers. Uh, I'm glad that He's ready and willing to hear all of us. Doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what your problem is, what your challenges are, uh, what your hang up is. It don't matter. God wants to hear from you. And if you'll come to Him in His way, He'll bless your life. That's what the Bible says. All the ends of the earth. Now that flies in the face of some churches that are us four no more though, don't it? Amen. Uh, God said, open the doors wide and all y'all come. Hallelujah. That's a blessing to me. 
You know, there's no such thing, therefore, as a limited atonement. That is, where Jesus died for only some, but not for all. I don't believe that. The Bible says in Hebrews 2, 9, said that He should taste death for every man. In 1 John 2 and 2, He's a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. In 1 John, or excuse me, John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish. Amen, but that all should come to repentance. You cannot walk. I don't care what they look like, what they act like, uh, you know, what their social status might be. You can't walk by, drive by, or bump into anyone that's not a candidate to be saved. Hallelujah. That's how good the gospel is. Amen. That's how good God is. And so he said not only... Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. All men. God wants everybody to be born again. That's why Jesus died. Not only uh, does he, uh, did Jesus die for all men, but then he invites all men to come. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Boy, you look at your world and we're seeing a world that's heavy laden with sin, boy. Amen. Heavy laden with wickedness and darkness. He said, come unto me. Come unto Do you remember when God saved your soul? Boy, I remember the dark, heavy burdens I was under when Jesus saved me. And I'm glad he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. Hallelujah. I'll give you rest. And then Revelation 22 and 17, the spirit and the bride say, come and let him that heareth say, uh, come and let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Amen. Now brother, you'd think with that kind of open door, that kind of power behind it, for the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. You'd think with that kind of opportunity, with that kind of power, you'd think we'd be heralding that thing not only all over town, but all over the world. Because there's hope in Christ and in the God of the Bible for everybody. And so we see the, 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 the scope of this salvation, help, and blessing. But then the third thing we see is the simplicity of it. In verse 22, he said, look. That's it. Look. Look unto me. Uh, and the idea there is the eye of faith. That's especially true when it comes to salvation. It doesn't say look unto me and turn over a new leaf. Live, live right. Uh, by the way, yeah, you know, uh, have you ever uh, turned over a new leaf only to find it's rotten on the bottom too? It, it doesn't say turn over a new leaf, live right, keep the Ten Commandments, promise you'll never sin again and thou shalt be saved. He said, look unto me and be ye saved. You know, if we had to promise to never sin again, we'd never make it. Uh, Christian, uh, Christians ought to live right uh, but we'll sin again for the sun goes down. The Bible says in James 4 and 17, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. And we leave good things undone every day of our life. So I'm glad he doesn't require us to you know, straighten up before we come to him or, 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 or stay straight after we're saved in the sense of doing it for our own salvation. The Bible says in Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all as an unclean thing. And all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. God is so holy that even the best of our goodness is filth in His sight. Amen. Ain't that something? But salvation doesn't depend on our living. It depends on our look. Look unto me and be you saved. Like the old hymn says, uh, there's light for a look at the Savior. And life more abundant and free. Look does not mean just admitting the historical facts of Jesus. 
There are many people that believe Jesus was an actual historical figure. And they'll even say that he was an unusually good man. But Jesus asked his disciples in Mark 8 and 27, Whom do men say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist. Some say Elias and others one of the prophets. That's the same thing they're saying today. Yeah, he was a good guy. He might have even been a prophet and a good preacher. But then Jesus asked his disciples, uh, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. That's the, that is the cry and the identification of the believer with regard to Jesus Christ. He's not just a good man, though he is. He's not just a prophet, though he is. He is the anointed one, the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the only Savior. That's what Peter was saying. Amen. And what a shame to have such a one as our Savior and neglect him day by day. Amen. To look means to depend. On Jesus. Amen. If I'm looking to him, I'm counting on him. Uh, and uh, that's the idea uh, of faith. Jesus is saying, depend upon me. I've got it covered. Trust, trust me. Rely on me. That's the idea we see in Hebrews 12 and 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto him. Now look. <laughs> Boy, howdy, how the church, and I should say church is. There's not going to, as we said earlier, there's not going to be one church until we're in heaven one day. Right now we have church is. And boy, have the churches made a mess of some things. Amen. And the unbelieving world looks at the churches and says, I don't want none of that. Amen. The skeptics say, I don't want anything to do with that. But you know the good thing is, it ain't about that anyway. It's about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jesus. You say, well, I got a lot of questions and problems with the church. Well, I guarantee you one thing. You'll not have any with Christ. Amen. Amen. And so uh, the idea here is that you're looking to Him, trusting in Him, relying on Him. There is no promise for salvation to anybody that trusts in or relies on any other thing. And so to look to Jesus, uh, to look to God, is to look away from anything else. And that's true not only in salvation, but after it as well. Amen. Remember Jesus preaching that hard sermon in John chapter number 6 when he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. Brother, they thought he was, uh, some of those uh, unbelievers thought he was talking about cannibalism. Yeah. Oh my goodness. You know, they want us to have a barbecue and him on top. We don't believe in that. No, sir, that guy's a nut. And the Bible says they all began to go away. Jesus told them clearly, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. I think it's verse 63 of John 6. There, he said, I'm not talking about that literally anyway. So they began to go away. Jesus was calling people to complete commitment to him. And they wouldn't do it. That's the way a lot of people nowadays, ain't it? That could be with salvation. Well, I trust Jesus, but I better do some good stuff too just in case. I'll trust Jesus, but I better get baptized and join the church. Keep giving. I don't want it. I don't want to. If I ever get salvation, I don't want to ever lose it. Well, let me tell you something. If you ever get it biblically, you never will lose it. Amen. Because it didn't start with you, and it ain't going to finish with you. Amen. Well, and so they all began to go away. <laughs> and Jesus looked at his disciples and said, Will you go away also? And Peter, in a moment of shining, instead of messing up, he, he said, to whom shall we go? Amen. Thou hast the words of life. Amen. Amen. Where are we going to go, Lord? You're everything we have. You are, uh, the Bible says, uh, our wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And according to Colossians 3 and 11, Christ is all and in all. So to look means to trust Him completely, but aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that God makes His blessings available by, simple, by a simple response of faith to Him? And so you see then the simplicity of it. And then you see the security of it. Verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved. 
all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Look unto me and be ye saved. He didn't say, look, at, look to me and I'll see what I can do. He didn't say, look to me and we'll try to put you in a... Uh, we'll, we'll try to put you into a fast track or something. Uh, he didn't say, look to me and we'll put you in a position to where it might come out okay at the end. That's not what he said. He said, look unto me and be ye saved. Man, uh, 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 you take somebody that's drowning. You see them drown. You run out there, you get them, you drag them in within 20 yards of shore and then drop them. Are they saved? Not as long as there's still a chance of them drowning. You go into a burning home, risk your life and uh, your own life and, and, and death and grab somebody and drag them down into the vestibule and drop them there and run out of the house. Have you saved them? Not as long as there's a chance of them still dying, you ain't. Man, they're not saved until they're good and clear of the present danger. And that's what God is saying. If you'll look to me, I'll pull you completely clear of the present danger. Amen. Be ye saved. And that, sal that salvation uh, uh, is complete in Christ. The Bible says he is able to save us unto the uttermost. Boy, there have been so many times when after salvation we've been unprofitable servants to the Lord. But God still pulled us clear the day we believed of ever having to face condemnation in Him, Romans 8 tells us. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now there might be the loss of reward one day because we didn't obey the Lord, but brother, there's no question we'll be with the Lord. Hallelujah. To be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. You look at the church at Corinth, had more problems you could shake a stick at, and he still called them brethren. Amen. Because back yonder when they believed, he pulled them clear of the idea of condemnation. Look unto me. And be ye saved. Now, look in your Bible with me at John 6, and we'll bring this thing in for a landing. John chapter number 6. Some of the great verses in the Bible that deal with everlasting life. John chapter number 6, and down here in verse number 37. John 6 and 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I will in no wise cast out. Oh, man. And you say, oh, but preacher, you don't know, you don't know what I've done since I've been saved. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Not that it don't matter, but it don't matter. Amen. You're still in the family. Now, just like when you was in your family, you took a whooping. You might do it in God's family. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Hebrews that he whips his kids. We said that last week, I think. And you thought your mom and daddy put a whooping on you. You ain't seen nothing until God get hold of you. <laughs> well, amen. So he says, verse 38. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Boy, that ought to be our life verse right there, at least our motive. Not to do our own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him. In case you're wondering who it is that the Father sent, you know, all that the Father giveth me. Somebody says, see, God only gives the elected ones to Jesus. No, that ain't what verse 40 says. Verse 40 says, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. 
How long is everlasting? That's forever. Every time you read everlasting, it means forever. And Jesus said, if you believe on him, you'll have everlasting life. Watch verse 40. And I will raise him up at the last day. Whether he wants to be or not, amen. Why? Because God's faithful. God is faithful. He doesn't put us in a position to be saved, brother. When we believe on him, he saves us. And when we look to him as Christians, he takes care of us. Now God's also, he'll let you follow. He's, I mean, the Bible says, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. You got to pick somebody. Chances are you already have. If it's not God, you're in trouble. For your salvation. If it's not God as a Christian, you're in trouble. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, uh, we'll serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. I mean, brother, we quote, we quote it, but we don't. We follow everything on the sun sometimes. You know, like those sheep we talked about before. Somebody said sheep were the dumbest animals on the face of the planet. You know, if you ever find a group of sheep and they get to going around a hill and, one, and, and, and the last one comes around just as the first one is going, they'll stand there all day and walk in a circle following one another. That's like what we are sometimes. And so, uh, but God says when he saves us, he, say, he said, be ye saved. That's the security of it. Why? Because the promise doesn't come from any man. The promise doesn't come from any church. The promise doesn't come from any organization or board or whatever. It comes from Jesus. Let God be true and every man a liar. All the promises in Him are yea. What that means is, if you, you may not know a lot of people like that, but one thing about Jesus is He keeps His promises. And so God says there in Isaiah 45 and 22, Look unto me and be ye saved. For I am God and there is none else. Now listen, that's true for salvation. That's true for the saint. It may be that some of you have been looking to the wrong thing for a long time. As believers, chasing the wrong thing, following the wrong things. Until you look to him, you're going to continue to meander around. No direction, no blessing, no help. But in Him is the only source, the only reliable source for salvation, help, and blessing. Let's stand together and bow our heads.